So I'm just going to give a little bit of uh, background, give some, uh, uh, and you can see me okay. Um, to face these definitions, uh, talk about the classification, some background concepts, and um, we don't go that deep into theory, just giving you a flavor for it, and then a few examples, and then the impact on uh, gym modeling. Uh, we just touch on that. Uh, that's a, a big topic as well. So uh, the goal then is um, to bring consistency to the basis logs in thus enhancing the um, okay there we go um, enhancing the workflows integration of the multi-scale data and the quality of our models the fidelity of our reservoir models so the premise here the premise of this whole discussion is that face these logs are typically not tuned optimally to the hierarchy uh, our hierarchical geomodeling workflows, that is bases simulated first, followed by uh, properties. Okay, so geomodeling involves concepts to models. So here we have an outcrop. Um, we have an outcrop <coughs> with, um, you know, an analog, um, you know, it's, it, it's a, this is a point bar uh, with a um, with uh, you know massive sand with uh, layered uh, muds and um, sands above, and so here's the concept on the right uh, that goes with it. We use uh, the outcrop at to define the analog to define the the facies, uh, textures, uh, you know, biomarkers, and from that we get our stratigraphy. That leads to our concept, our depositional concept, and then we go to classification. And classification of our data, our logs, uh, is shown here. With that integration, uh, we go to the integration building models, and so then um, have a model shown on the right here with some of the concepts and faces. And we're ultimately after the physical behavior, statistical and physical behaviors in the reservoir. So then we're looking at um, multi-scale data. We're working with things like uh, core, logs, uh, we have to block the logs because we're building grids. Uh, we have geomodel scale and flow model scales, which can be larger, smaller, different. Uh, we also have seismic, which measures a different scale than the well logs, the block logs, and uh, we need to integrate it in the models. So we're working with multi-scale data. Uh, Faces then are used for conditioning and uh, they're treated as a hard data type. Uh, they're used to represent and honor, honor reservoir heterogeneities, facies uh, first, uh, help us with uh, modeling the reservoir architecture, and that's described by that sequence of lithophases. Then within the facies, we get the variability of the rock properties. And this is, uh, that combination of the two is what uh, represent reservoir heterogeneities. So facies are treated as a truth variable, as a hard data type. So we need to um, improve them for modeling. And they also represent statistical stationary domains of properties, that they're consistent properties within facies. So it's a significant data type influencing the entire subsurface workflow. And we're going from static models to dynamic. So having uh, good facies, good electrophases, or facies logs going into the modeling process allows us to have uh, higher fidelity models and have a line of sight between that static model 
and the uh, flow simulator. So these are the kinds of parameters that the engineers might be interested in, and that's um, helped by a good basis model. So our issues are scaling the facies through the modeling into rock types and preserving heterogeneity. Uh, definitions. This is a geo talk. Um, the kind of definitions are uh, the, coming from different practitioners. And so facies is a uh, broadly used term. It's a general term used to reflect any and all rock definitions. Lithophases describe the characteristics of real rock, and they're typically described during visual inspection of actual samples. Then the bio and ichnophases describe biological content of the actual samples through visual identification, which supports differentiation of depositional environments, and it can lead to some textural uh, awareness, textural uh, interpretation as well. Uh, depo facies are commonly a uh, broadly used term and really just are a uh, catch-all for depositional uh, environments and, and um, the lithophases and images. Uh, electrophases are this term describing the log-derived lithologies or rock types using multivariate statistical methods. Petrophases is commonly used, and it's just using um, log-derived lithologies or rock types using petrophysical curves uh, with uh, some kind of logic. Uh, rock types, um, you know, that's the engineering term. So we want to have a line of sight across some of these so classification, um, you know, it's um, of, of actual, our actual data uh, would be to combine uh, rock fabric, pore space, petrophysics. There's some classic papers on that, um, say carbonate studies uh, from the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, there's detailed description of depositional and or uh, diagenetic processes from core or image data, and electrophases, as mentioned, uses multivariate statistics, and we use wireline, uh, and core, or image uh, description of facies to, in the training. And so there are classic papers here on, on the background methods uh, in, in the industry. Uh, the rules-based Petrophysical classification is what's used for petrophases using cutoffs or polygons, visual uh, methods. So ultimately, we're trying to account for the quality of pores uh, and the engineering impact of that pore space. Uh, as well, we're trying to account for spatial location, both vertically and laterally. So preparing the databases uh, requires uh, a commitment, a time, and effort to clean and understand the, the information. The advantages, um, you know, electrophase, the electrophases is an underused application, and it provides a robust uh, framework of methods. It can improve integration and consistency in the application of well data conditioning in the full geomodeling workflow. It strengthens geology to flow principles. Uh, there's a decreased observational bias in facies classification, um, and we'll mention this again. Uh, there's a decreased facies classification uncertainty we have faster run times in our subsurface workflows. It's an enabler of first pass or, or faster model building. And so we have a potentially a reduced need for coring, uh, at least from a modeling perspective. I'm a big believer in uh, acquiring core and other subsurface information, but it is an option. 
uh, that justifies the use. Uh, barriers to adoption, uh, there are workflow steps that are not widely established in industry practice or promoted by software vendors. Uh, it's, it's not consistently um, taught or disseminated. There's a lack of best practice guidance and training. Uh, there's certainly misuse or just uh, call it suboptimal application of the methods. And so there's a lack of dissemination of this software and technology to G and G staff beyond petrophysicists. And this really holds back the technology. It, it should involve, uh, you know, treating it as a as an open team driven interpretation uh, and a guided machine learning process. We don't have enough information to make it a fully automated process. So we need to really invoke concepts uh, as we go. Electrophases, uh, the general theory, and um, let's go through this here. Uh, we identify which um, phases classes to assign to the well data without phases description. So we have phases description, logs, image, seismic curves. So here we have all these points are classified uh, in this cross plot of uh, density gamma. We have two new samples and we want to identify which group they belong to, sand or shale. And so if we look at an individual variable, uh, we have maybe a bimodal distribution in each, but it's not enough to discriminate. So in this example of a, a here, we find a rotation in space, this discriminant function that best separates the two clusters, so it gives these um, the best separation and also gives the least spread or the least inflation of the two clusters. So this is really the class covariance is minimized and the between class covariance is maximized to get the separation shown here. So that's a linear discriminant analysis, a parametric method. Uh, and following on with that, we have uh, these uh, density clouds, the clusters, and the center of mass is a centroid for each of these clusters, kind of like this, the mean is a center of mass to a histogram or distribution. So a centroid is for the multivariate space. And then the distance away from each centroid is Malinopus distance. And that's for each sample and that sets up the probability of each unknown sample to belong to uh, one of these two centroids or, or classes. And so these can be well behaved. Um, or they can have different sizes and shapes. And so the uh, non-parametric will allow us to go to no size shape assumption. So in a simple example of an unsupervised discriminant analysis, we're looking at the modes or the high density areas. And uh, here we have three variables three cross plots, which would be the center of the multivariate distribution or, or along the axes of each of the variables. We, we've identified some high density areas. We've seeded those. And uh, you could imagine there might be more um, clusters, but we're just gonna look at binary. Just two. So we use these uh, for the training. 
identify those points for training, then we classify. So now we have a two variable, or sorry, a two facies system, a binary facies using three variables. And then this is what it looked like on one of the logs. There were a handful of wells involved. And we compare that to porosity. I've color coded the porosity just to show how nicely it matches. Uh, whereas, um, oh, and, and porosity was computed from density and gamma. That's uh, two variables used in it, whereas the electrophasis is three variables. If we compare to V shell, which sometimes is used to come up with a uh, quick faces, it's one variable with bounds, and it doesn't match uh, that nicely. So what this is illustrating is that just a quick, unsupervised electrophasis uh, is, is um, you know, useful and, and does um, provide some uh, consistency with uh, the well logs and, and the processing. So assumptions, I'd like to, uh, we have a little bit of time in this talk. I wanna go over these assumptions quickly because um, when we use a parametric method, we have assumptions, but non-parametric, we, we don't have, you know, the, these underlying assumptions. And so we use this, uh, these ideas to provide a way to, look at our data. I find it very helpful, even though in the talk, I'm gonna tell you to use non-parametric methods. So first, the observations in each class, that is each facies in the you know, facies description in core, randomly chosen, uh, that's um, observed facies are not random. They're spatially biased, as is the natural variability of depositional successions. Geology is not random in its um, stacking. The probability of an unknown observation belonging to each class is equal. Well, this is not true because facies proportions are not equal in nature. We could have a, a uh, very important shale that's thin and a barrier. Uh, so as an example, variables are normally distributed within each class. Well, the biphases distributions of log variables have various shapes. For example, a, a uh, mud or shale might have a very low or very high gamma ray with a, a tail on it. Uh, conversely, uh, a high quality sand might uh, have the low gamma or low density with the uh, tail skewed distribution. So then the variance covariance matrices of the classes are equal in size. Well, no, they can have different spreads. The, the properties of each facies have a different spread and a different uh, you know, size and shape. Uh, finally, none of the observations used to calculate the function were misclassified. Well, this is uh, an important point because facies and logs have many imprecisions um, leading to erroneous petrophysical statistics. For example, you have depth shifts like core shifts. Uh, there's um, you know mismatch of the facies interpretation and in the logs. There's also scale that the facies might be interpreted um, as facies associations or or not quite at the scale to match the log curve variability, and I'll show examples of that. So there's bed boundary overlap. Uh, as well, the logs themselves may need to be normalized uh, from different vintages, different vendors, and there's just interpretive ambiguities uh, within the um, data sets. So electrophases classification, we discuss the um, parametric approach here uh, with unsupervised, I showed you, we mentioned supervised in the first uh, 
And so we're looking for this orientation in space that uh, best separates. And so data may have um, data may have a more interesting shape as um, the distribution uh, than the parametric allows. Uh, so parametric methods don't necessarily capture the, uh, the actual um, interpreted facies uh, variability and, and shapes. So the parametric non-parametric methods do uh, allow us to, to uh, honor the, the shapes and distributions. And so the idea here, I'm just illustrating, uh, say, a Bayesian setup where the probability of a given a new sample uh, to be part of one basis is um, it, that probability to be in a particular facies class is um, a function of the occurrence of different log curve values. So that's what this is illustrating. Now I'm going to go into examples and we'll illustrate some of the points and, and issues. So case one is just one summary slide. Uh, here we had a carbonate reef. The study was done actually many years ago now. And um, we modeled the facies to uh, capture uh, the, well, we only had 10% facies coverage on the well logs. And we wanted to capture the difference in facies from the fore reef to the lagoon. There's different energy environments. And so for similar porosities, we have different permeability uh, distributions. And, and the key here then was that we were able to classify facies uh, in the different lateral zones in this backstepping reef and get four reef facies, uh, back reef lagoon, and uh, capture more uh, variable uh, permeability in the higher energy environments, and it allowed the company to get a, a much better history match. At that time, people were really emphasizing just porosity models across carbonate reefs. Um, case two, the uh, Hadron field, um, I'll just quickly go over this one. We're focused on the lower zone, it's just showing an unfaulted uh, image. This was used as a demo data set, uh, public information. And uh, we had 17 wells, four facies. The training set is this many samples, and we trained uh, this many samples. And so the, the cleanup, I just show one example of cleanup. Uh, we clean outliers from the distribution and uh, there was a bimodal depot basis, which we split and reassigned. And that's illustrated here, where we have uh, uh, gamma, neutron, density. Uh, the seismic was really not depth shifted properly, was not useful in this one. Uh, but there's this, uh, the blue is showing the bimodal. One of the faces was uh, very much bimodal. And so we were, inspected the well logs. This was a demo data set, so I didn't have a geologist to, to speak to about this, but uh, the um, by inspecting the logs, I, I simply removed that upper uh, poor quality mode and assigned it to a different face. Sometimes I would, I might decide to drop it and let it reclassify on its own. In this case, I, I assigned it to another, or included in another face. So in the results, just to give you a feel for how the classification is um, uh, proceeds, we have the training set, so the logs and, and, and cleaned up faces, and we had four, four faces, and these are the proportions of them. Uh, when we train the data, uh, the same training set uh, created a model, 
uh, the percentage of faces one drop, uh, two stayed the same, three drop, and uh, the fourth one, a high proportion faces increase. Uh, when we applied it to all the log coverage, that we see wells without faces, uh, faces one went up a little bit, uh, back up a little bit, it drifted up. The other two was the same, three went dropped, and four uh, continued to go up. So this is something that we might want to adjust if we want to try to honor the input, although we haven't really considered declustering or the clustering of the data. But this was just a direct uh, approach programmed up by uh, my uh, co-author on this study. We didn't use commercial software for it. So we, uh, in commercial software, you'd have the ability to apply some additional posterior weights. Uh, and carrying on with this example, it illustrates the parts, the moving parts in electrophasis classification. We have um, the training set is represented here by three logs and the cleaned uh, faces, the ambiguities, tails, um, that bimodal change. And that would be part one. Part two is the probabilities associated with the four faces. So we might uh, in the classification process, we get the probabilities. Uh, most commercial software will show you these probabilities. They're excellent for QC. And then uh, we get the faces that's represented by the maximum probability. So here it's the output is a yellow, and there's a high probability of this yellow faces. Down here, uh, the training set had the red, but it, uh, the probability uh, is um, high for both blue and red. So we have some a higher degree of heterogeneity in this output. Then um, moving to another example, I'll go into a few different details here. We did some um, lumping and cleaning. Uh, we cleaned pretty heavily using uh, distributions. Uh, for example, this uh, car these carbonate stringers is a higher density. Uh, were separated quite a lot for the training. And um, here we have sand to the muddiest uh, bases, high gamma. And so we used uh, pretty heavy cleaning in this uh, data set. The classification then is shown here. So we were, uh, by adjusting the data, we actually, uh, it's an, not an unbiased process at all. It requires interpretation, but it gave us the right kind of separation. And um, so we use this, uh, you know, Bayesian classifier uh, with some weighting on the bases. And, and illustrating kind of validation here, we had a model and uh, with some with new data uh, this well uh, in discussing this with the sedimentologist um, going from this uh, lower to upper shore face uh, there was not enough uh, intermediate quality sand or degraded sand and so I slightly adjusted the probabilities uh, on the classification of weight. And it's a nonlinear process. Um, uh, we got an appropriate um, lowering of the, the quality here. It's still a net sand, but what it does is it changes the permeability model. And so the sweep uh, in the flow is, is different and, and more realistic. Uh, for this case. So it's really based on geologic concepts that we might adjust proportions. And we also want to have the sedimentologist inputs to uh, guide the process. 
Um, checking models, there's a lot of, we have a long discussion on this slide, but I just wanna uh, touch on a couple of points. Uh, one, um, this uh, FACES, for example, just shows that it was 85% correctly classified from the training set. And it shows that the error, if you wanna call it statistical error, is that some of that input training basis was reclassified to an adjacent quality basis. So this is that bed boundary effect. It's not necessarily wrong. It's a statistical error, but it's not necessarily wrong. So this basis was a, a kind of laminated uh, sand and it uh, regrouped um, into different qualities of, of bases. Uh, so the process provides a consistency with the well logs. And, and there's other um, tools and QCs. Uh, for example, I, in this, uh, I used uh, porosity, but porosity is calculated from density and gamma mainly with some other petrophysical corrections and, and some loss. And uh, so there's actually a redundancy in the variables in this particular uh, image. So using, a, say, an eigenvalue problem, principal confidence, we uh, really only had three effective variables. So there's other QC, and uh, that's another subject in the practice uh, to go into. So comments, uh, it's possible to influence the result by changing these kinds of parameters. The wells used to set up the training set to guide the prediction. The log curve choices or sets used for discrimination and classification. And then the FACES data, the amount of cleaning, lumping, splitting. And it's important to, to go to proceed with the cleaning and um, remove some of those low probability faces in the training sets. Uh, then the assignment probabilities um, using these posterior weights, there's weighting in most of the commercial packages and, and it is a nonlinear process. It's, uh, you're not just um, doubling a proportion of your faces by doubling that weight. The, uh, then there's different methods and um, as I said, use the non-parametric methods when you're working with a training set with bases. Uh, it works much better than these uh, parametric methods. And uh, there's another topic on uh, kernel operators in the different packages. It would be in the advanced parameters if you can access it. Um, nearest neighbors commonly use Stepanet Shakoff. Uh, and Gaussian tend to work better, adapt better than uh, uh, but that's uh it's essentially how you smooth the data in the multivariate space or smooth the covariances uh, in the process. Okay, so then uh, that FACES model, I showed you this slide. Uh, and um, we have these facies, this electrophases, which is a different heterogeneity scale than the input. Here's um, a simple framework. Um, here's a model, it's not necessarily the same. This is a small area, this is a larger area of the facies model. But a key uh, point is that we had a distinct in this case, uh, this is, I believe, the porosity. So we have uh, distinct petrophysical characteristics of each of these uh, lithophases. So then in this uh, case three, the conclusions from that study, uh, we had a petrophysically consistent, robust electrophases model uh, that was used for, for geomodeling. Uh, the number of core facies was reduced based on the similarity in log response. We really couldn't discriminate 
um, the number that we had, and, and so some lumping was appropriate. And, and this is a common practice with geomodeling uh, workflows. Uh, the core description uh, used to classify the electrophases, um, you know, you know, was used, and we used a non-parametric uh, approach. Uh, we did then account for vertical trends, um, and, and in this particular study, we separated into layers for the um, classification process uh, because there were some trends in the faces. The proportions of the input training samples are used as a guide for the output proportions in general, but again, we the, the commercial software does not provide the clustering, uh, so we have to make some judgments there. Uh, geologic concepts are then further used to validate and adjust basic proportions uh, to honor the, the strong concepts. And fluid effects on logs, uh, we didn't discuss, but they can cause erroneous classifications, and there are some procedures uh, to address them. The optimum number of curves I've found in these studies over the years is really between three and six. You're not getting uh, much more out of the data. In fact, it can even get worse when you have the six and plus. So selecting curves that are reliable and thought to be representative of the rock types or the lithophases is important. And the geologic concept uh, input from geologists is critical. Uh, so feedback from the team members uh, after using the electrophases can be beneficial when updating models. Here's example four. Um, this one is just illustrating uh, the log scale variation in this point bar uh, model. Uh, here's the faces. These um, these um, faces were at a coarser scale than the well log, and so the electrophases very much changes the heterogeneity scale. And so these Electrophases then carry the properties into the models. And that's the key point here. And, and on that same field study, a different from a different paper, um, that um, you know, I contributed to the here's the elect uh, the uh, input facies for the training. Here's the electrophases. And note that the electrophase is very much law, matches the log scale variability. This is uh, really important for modeling, for blocking wells, and scaling models. The other point is that this very much uh, is uh, shown, this, this variability is shown in these image logs. Uh, blind tests, it's another part of the practice. Um, I've used these over the years. Um, we basically withhold some wells um, in some software. We withhold samples, sample sets. Uh, the concept faces then are mainly defined by presented percentages of mud visually, i.e. the V-shell range. This is for this uh, point bar system that we were looking at. And some geometric textural issues uh, that apply from the uh, Bioturbation and brushes and such. Uh, so we wanted to check the how the classification errors behave, and they tend, as I said, to be a reclassification to an adjacent quality faces. Actually, it can be quite beneficial for creating a petrophysically consistent uh, faces log for geomodeling. And Brecht is one of these textural Faces and and what I've seen is that breccia can be uh, very broadly interpreted and, and you could have a clasp in a beautiful sand and it's treated as a breccia or be mostly a mud with a few rips 
in it, and it's also regression. So uh, it needs to be uh, treated carefully. Uh, so the mode, you know, it, it turns out, and at least in this study, it, it fit nicely um, in a kind of middle quality uh, area of our, our of our um, bases. So the there's a stepwise kind of approach we can take, and here we had three to six curves, the three base curves uh, most commonly used would be uh, density gamma neutron. Uh, in sonic, when we have it, uh, is very helpful for, say, uh, discriminating breaches. It really improves the classification of breaches and training sets. A photoelectric can be helpful. Turns out it does need to be checked and normalized. It's not always um, looked at as carefully as, say, gamma uh, by the petrophysicists to, to uh, normalize the database. And then the shear sonics, uh, they're a lower frequency measurement, and I didn't find those to be that helpful here. Uh, so there's a lot of topics we could get into uh, in, in the more advanced discussion of, the, of some of the uh, implementations. So here we have the three to six curves. Uh, here's our input training, yes. I have just a couple of more slides here. Uh, so the input is shown here. Uh, we have the three to six um, variables, and um, and so they all uh, represent uh, an improvement for uh, input to the geomodeling. And and here's uh, three different wells for blind tests. So really. Um, Muddy well, uh, just illustrating the quality there. Uh, a nice uh, high quality well showing some degradation uh, of, of facies that was not captured by the geologic interpretation. And um, electrophases leads then to um, our ability to come up with better petrophysical models. Uh, here, capturing um, percolation effects in perm and water saturation trends uh, in our in our models for modeling purposes and and the high quality phases the best sand has a has a sharp transition whereas as we get to lower quality sands it's a steeper transition so this is empirical so we can get empirical okay questions 